You're listening to A Book With Legs, a podcast presented by Smead Capital Management. At Smead Capital Management, we advise investors who fear stock market failure. You can learn more at SmeadCap.com or by calling your financial advisor. Welcome to A Book With Legs podcast. I'm Cole Smead, CEO and Portfolio Manager here at Smead Capital Management. At our firm, we are readers, and we believe in the power of books to help shape informed investors. In this podcast, we speak to great authors about their writings. The late, great Charlie Munger prescribed using multiple mental models and analysis. We analyze their work through the lens of business, markets, and people. Thank you to our audience for joining us today. We are going to look back at really the history of a country. We're going to think about its currency. We're going to think about its politics. And we're going to think about what transformation means. Uh, joining us today is Ekaterina Pravilova with her book, The Ruble, A Political History. A little bit about Ekaterina. She's the Rosengarten Professor of Modern and Contemporary History and the director of the Russian program in Russia, Eastern Europe, and Eurasian Studies at Princeton University. She is the author of award-winning A Public Empire, Property, and the Quest for Common Good in Imperial Russia, as well as Legality and Individual Rights, Administrative Justice in Russia, and Finances of Empire, Money and Power in Russian Policy in the Imperial Borderlands, published in Russian. She is a native of St. Petersburg, Russia. She has also received her PhD from the Russian Academy of Sciences. She was a research scholar at the Academy of Sciences and taught history at the European University at St. Petersburg from 2002 to 2006. So uh, we're going to get an insider's look at this up close. Ekaterina, thank you for joining me today. Uh, thank you for inviting me. So you, you've obviously done a lot of writing on Russia. You're from there originally. I think this is just an intriguing discussion. I remember when I came across your book, I thought, wow, what a time to talk about the ruble and what a timely uh, work you had. But I, I want to ask you, what, what made you use this lens of the currency and the ruble as a way to look at really the pre-communist Russian history? Well, initially, I didn't want to write this book. It was almost accidental. I was working on something else. I worked on, uh, actually, it was a very narrow episode, a history of counterfeiting in Russia in the 1860s. And when I was researching this uh, Russian government trying to foil the plots of counterfeiters, I realized that there was one fundamental problem behind it because uh, this rise of counterfeiting uh, originated from the lack of trust, of people's trust in sure. the government and Russian currency. So uh, sometimes we think that the historians, how they write the book, uh, the books, they start from point A and go to point B from Peter the first to Nicholas the second, or I don't know, uh, from Lenin to Gorbachev. But often it, it doesn't happen this way. So it started from the mid 19th century, and then they just realized that I, I, I do want to write the history of Russian currency to explain this lack of trust and the, the financial problems of uh, Russian economy through the lens of politics, because I realized that this is the fundamental issue in, in the history of the ruble. So let's start with Catherine the Great. She obviously was a dominating authority in this idea of autocracy uh, in the monarchy. Can you teach our listeners what assignats were and what did they allow the holder to do? Oh, uh, you're asking about as the so-called, in Russian, they're called assignatsy, right? Okay. The first Russian paper money, or assignia, we can uh, pronounce in the French manner, assignia. So the assignatsy, or the assignia, as we were introduced, um, introduced in 1768, well, 69, um, was the idea just replace very inconvenient and heavy coins, this Russian system was based on the circulation of copper, silver, and gold. And of course, most people used the copper coins. Um, the most popular coin was the five copper uh, coin, and it was pretty heavy. Um, Princeton University uh, Library has a numismatic collection, and I went there just to hold this coin in my hand. And it actually weighed almost like a, you know, you will fill it in your pocket. It's like a half of the weight of your iPhone, maybe. Sure. Maybe just a little bit. So transporting these sums of money was just a terribly inconvenient for the purposes of, of trade, commerce, but also for the purposes of the state, how to collect taxes, um, and also how to transport money to pay for war expenses. So this be the beginning of the issuance of paper money, this assignats, 
coincided with the Ru Russia's entrance of Catherine the Great's first war against Turkey, uh, the Ottoman Empire. And um, so this uh, reform or the appearance of paper money pursued two uh, goals. One, to make this uh, money circulation much more convenient and easy. Uh, and lighter, and the second goal was goal was of course compensate for the lack of resources uh, for the state. So, when you ask so what what are the purpose or what are the circumstances and what the people could do, they we should separate between these two um, agents or the actors, the state and the people. And of, of course, for people, it was just inconvenience. But simple folk um, peasants continue to use coins. It's only the the assignats uh, were mostly the the money of the rich and the state. And for the state, of course, it was a, a very convenient method of raising uh, income, but also simplifying tax collection and, and trade. Uh, and trade. So, but the assignats, they they would still get discounted, wouldn't they, by the people that tried to use them? Oh yeah, absolutely. For the from uh, this is a very important point about this uh, the initial idea of assignats. They were they were not even called real money. Um, is is uh, the government legislation and people talk about them as representative, representative of, of real money. So it's like a, a something that uh, in place of the coin. So it's not real. It's just a, like an image of 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 the coin. Um, but people could definitely go come to the bank, and there are two banks established, and there, there are more uh, later. The Asinian banks, a signature bank in Saint Petersburg and in Moscow, and in the first years, they could freely exchange um, assignats at any point for um, copper and silver. And then there, the states started running out of silver, and only copper became uh, the, the kind of the exchange um, uh, species for uh, for the assignats. But uh, exactly in the first, very first years, there is um, non-stoppable exchange uh, of assignats for 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 coins. So just to hit on it, the, can you just mention the two banking structures? You mentioned their location, but did they play a different function to each other for the assignats? No, the, the banks were, well, we call them the banks then, and they were called the banks. But uh, essentially, this first bank, they function just as a, uh, cashiers, just the exchange offices, like the big exchange offices established by the state and and then the huge, uh, with a huge um, storage for, for these coins that were uh, kept there in leather bags. Mm -hmm. um, and the only function of this Asinias banks would just to exchange the Asinias for coins and, and, and collect coins uh, and collect the Asinias. So I think a really interesting distinction early in the book was Catherine the Great's view of foreign loans, okay? Um, she she looked at foreign loans and credit, you know, she's, she looked at one was assigned to effectively the people and one was assigned to the monarchy. Can you, can you kind of talk about that? Because that becomes a pretty common theme across the book is how the monarchy looks at debt versus how the public or the markets look at debt. Yeah, so uh, the... These first assignments initially they were perceived as as a as a state's debt, right? The state's debt um, in relation to to people as, as if the state poured from the people by replacing uh, uh, coins with with paper. And sure. uh, essentially, the assignments they even look like uh, promissory notes um, uh, or vexil. Um, they were so simple in design. There were no even no state symbolism, no um, two-headed eagle or any other um, symbols of the state or the monarchy or the dynasty. So they're very, very plain and, and without any, um, like very few ornaments. Uh, therefore, they, they were perceived as, as like a, a, a promise you notes given by the state. Uh, but uh, later, this idea um, started like losing popularity in the government and bureaucracy because what came instead was the idea that, in fact, the state cannot borrow anything from the people and should not borrow because the state has the power. It has the power of take whatever it wants at any point. So this idea of balancing the interest of the people and, and, and the monarchy kind of disappeared from this financial sphere. Um, and of course, the relationship between Russia and the foreign 
um, uh, creditors were based on totally different uh, model because Russia uh, during catch and regrade times for the first time starts borrowing in Europe. So mm-hmm. these things had not been, had not happened before, and of course it connected these two financial innovations happening almost at the same time: the introduction of paper money and Russia's um, opening the doors, uh, like the foreign market capital, um, and uh, Russia was perceived like no one. In, in this uh, European market, nobody knew uh, uh, Russia is, is a good um, uh, debtor or uh, someone who would, uh, a country that will pay all debts back. And therefore, Katrin was very, very happy and at the same time very cautious in, in dealing with uh, foreign creditors. And until the very end, until the fall of this uh, the um, uh, Russian Empire in 1917, the government always prioritized um, the repayment of foreign debts, overall domestic obligations. A theme that also comes up throughout the book, you have some wonderful data, um, just so our audience is aware, on the rubles outstanding and how that grows over different you know eras. Were there limits on Catherine's assignats? And if those were raised, what ultimately backed the assignat when they raised those caps? Yes, um, initially there was a limit established as uh, one uh, one hundred thousand rubles, and Catherine pledged not to exceed uh, not to exceed uh, the, this amount. And uh, but very very soon, of course, they breached the limit. And if before, um, and and of course, when the, the limit was breached, the, the 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 banks had difficulties exchanging assignats for for coins, and and the, the assignats rate began to. Uh, fall. Uh, therefore, if initially the assignats were seen as being backed up by this metal reserve, this mm-hmm. coins kept in the storages of the assignats banks, later this idea kind of lost its ground. Sure. And uh, the, another idea was introduced, and the idea that the value of money in an autocratic country rests not on any metal reserve, but on the power and the promise of, of, of the ruler, of the empress. A Catherine pledged <laughs> several times uh, for for the exchangeability, of, uh, convertibility of assignats or for not exceeding this certain amount. Uh, but uh, of course it didn't help. Uh, but this idea kind of persisted throughout again 18th and 19th century that the, in autocratic country, the relationship between money, the throne, and the people, um, uh, this relationship are based on totally different principles than than uh, anywhere else. This next question I'm going to ask you I couldn't be more appropriate as we think about the world we're in today. My question is, why did Catherine's government overspend on war? And then you do a good job of pointing out like what the local critiques were and kind of the, I'll call it the local conspiracy theories of why, say, the ruble would would do poorly and not have, you know, would be devalued. They just began to make rubles supply, uh, you know, meet the government needs ultimately. They oversupplied the market with money. Uh, why did they not recognize at that time even that, that money supply did change, as you pointed out just a second ago, the idea of trust? Yeah, uh, the thing is that, of course, in the 18th century, the glory of empire rested not on economic wealth, but on military abilities. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, and, and of course, the Russian Empire was uh, becoming or trying to become a great power competing with uh, or against other um, neighboring uh, empires. And therefore, uh, of course, from the point of view of this prestige of the monarchy, uh, conquering lands and conquering people and spending on, on war or fighting against the enemies of Russia and the enemies of orthodoxy was always a priority. Uh, therefore, the costs and like even discussing the costs of a war was kind of inappropriate uh, sometimes. And um, of course, this, there were critique, um, critiques um, of Ketchin's policy who were pointing out that the government undermines by spending so much and increasing the amount, overprinting uh, assignats, it undermines uh, people's trust. And this idea, uh, I think it appeared in this financial sphere 
uh, very, very early. So this is the uh, um, 1780s, so the time mm-hmm. before the French Revolution, the French Revolution that brought the idea of pop- popular sovereignty when uh, the idea that um, economy and wealth produced by labor belongs to the people this idea before the French Revolution was not yet in the air, um, uh, especially in Russia. Um, and therefore, this people who crit- crit- criticize Kitchen policy voiced for the first time this concept of uh, popular sovereignty in the financial spheres, that the state has obligations because the wealth, the national economy belongs to the people. Um, yeah, so th- I think that it was a pretty radical, very radical and, and liberal idea for, for the time. This show is brought to you by SME Capital Management. We hope you're enjoying the podcast. You know, we work hard putting together this show, but we work even harder for our investors at SME Capital Management. At SME, we believe in disciplined investing, which is why the SME funds have a proven track record of long-term outperformance. If you're an investor who fears stock market failure and want to invest in wonderful companies to build wealth, we invite you to visit smecap.com. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Investing involves risk, including loss of principal. Please refer to the prospectus for important information about the investment company, including objectives, risks, charges, and expenses. Read and consider it carefully before investing. Smeet funds distributed by UMB Distribution Services, LLC, not affiliated. Another area that you explained, they were kind of more radical currency use going on in the Russian Empire. You you discussed uh, what happened in the early to mid 19th century in Russia's Alaska. Um, They obviously had a different form of currency there. Can you explain the currency that was present in Alaska, why it was created? Yeah, so uh, Alaska was governed by a Russian American company. Um, so essentially, uh, the the money that uh, circulated there, the, the so-called Marx market, um, uh, this uh, we can describe as a form of private money because sure. uh, issued uh, the, this Marx were issued by the Russian American company. At the same time, the Russian American company belonged to the state; it was a representative of the state, and um, so the. Um, the idea of uh, introducing them, this, uh, the marks um, belong to the company and, and the government itself. And uh, the, the marks were printed on the pieces of, of, of skin or leather, um, therefore kind of su- uh, emphasizing the, maybe the purposes of, of the whole Russia's acquisition of Alaska as being a, a colony supplying uh, skins and in, in the furs and um, to to the Russian state and, and selling. So therefore, this uh, marks were uh, very p- interesting in a very peculiar uh, form of currency because they only circulated within the stores of the company and um, uh, mostly used by indigenous uh, people who were mm-hmm. employed uh, by the Russian American company. Uh, I'm saying employed, uh, and of course you, you can imagine that it was not uh, normal or like free employment. They were essentially enslaved uh, by the company because uh, the, the, there was no free market uh, for them. They had to use this marks only to purchase uh, goods available in, in the company stores. So it's a very... Um, Quill form of exploitation through financial means from through the introduction of of this specific um, uh, colonial currency. When you pointed out how that even you know that would be discounted because no one other than the store would take the marks, and therefore things like skins and other things uh, were more readily exchangeable because people could go out and barter those into other goods. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, of course, uh, there was another kind of there was barter uh, in Alaska in in the Russian settlements, and uh, there were all the valuable things uh, such as alcohol or, of course, order skins. Uh, but for uh, again, for the indigenous people um, employed by the company, it was a very very limited possibilities of of using uh, coins. And of course, there were not assignats there because it's just they, they were not delivered there. Um, Russian Empire was extremely vast, and in the early 19th century, uh, the, the ruble was not the only currency circulating 
um, across the, the old imperial space. Uh, at that point, uh, in the early 19th century, if I start just naming all kinds of currencies, the uh, money that existed, there will be a very, very long list because there is a sure. special currency in the Caucasus and then uh, it was in Poland, it was uh, you know, in Alaska, was this the, this Russian marks um, and elsewhere. So uh, the ruble was just becoming uh, the national, uh, national imperial currency very, very slowly. Alexander I was educated, as you wrote, quote, in the best tradition of the European Enlightenment, end quote. H- how does the liberalism that was floating around Europe at that time uh, affect Russia's monarchy and-, and shape the forward view from Alexander I on with the role of money? Yes, uh, uh, Alexander was very well educated, as I wrote in the book, because uh, Ketrin, who was his... Uh, um, key teacher and therefore she she was a avid reader of uh, enlightenment uh, literature and thinkers and thinkers and she befriended some of them and corresponded with some of them so uh, Alexander her grandson received a brilliant education um, and he he as well as many other aristocrats uh, of this era were um, very well versed in all contemporary economic uh, liberal political ideas. So they read in um, French was the language of conversation, and of course they read everything, um, all books published at that time uh, on political economy in French as well as in English and, and in German. So uh, Russian elite was very cosmopolitan. Elite. And um, in the first decades of the 19th century, censorship was relaxed, um, and uh, these books could be delivered uh, to Russia and read, uh, read, translated. So we shouldn't think about Russia as being like behind this iron wall <laughs> as during sure. the Cold War. Of course, they, it belonged to the market of ideas, and ideas circul- circulated at least in the first decades of the 19th century uh, freely. Later, the, the Nicholas I uh, will introduce more strict control over the circulation of Western harmful ideas. But in the early 19th century, that, that was not yet the case. People were still hopeful is what you're saying. Let's see, let's go to Nikolai Mordanov. He made the point that, quote, all kinds of money derive their validity from the productive force of the national economy, end quote. This is assumed in today's world, obviously. How, how, how was the view of money deriving its validity prior? Was it just the monarchy, or was it bullion? Uh, well, Mardvinov, in this quote, what he wanted to say, um, that the government cannot do whatever it wants with the money, <laughs> with, sure. with, with national currency. This is, was his idea. Mm-hmm. And uh, he, of course, he hinted that the, there should be an institution, like a bank, uh, with a bullion reserve that will uh, regulate the issuance of, of, of paper uh, assignments. But the next point in this uh, kind of line or logical connections will be people's labor, because even money represents labor. In between that, the bullion, even coins, the gold, they're also forms of representation of value. But the value is produced by, by people who work. Um, And uh, this economic formula, uh, labor coming from produced, uh, uh, the the products produced by by people that are, could be exchanged on the basis of this representative, either gold, and then the second will be, another point will be paper. Um, And this economic formula had a parallel in political sphere. This for, therefore we call it a, economic and political liberalism, because he thought this economic control translates into political control. That sure. means that people should go, should be able to control the activity of the government. We also see that money is also the seed to fight autocracy in your book. Is it fair to say that every attempt at currency reform actually attempted to limit, limit the monarchy's role slowly over time? Yes, uh, um, that is correct. And uh, we mentioned, just mentioned liberalism. And of course, uh, liberalism was born in Europe as well as in Russia mm-hmm. in reaction to French Revolution. So it was an alternative to radical change. But 
as soon as these, these liberal ideas appeared, we also can see the emergence of political reaction, this conservatism and nationalism that appeared just at the same time uh, in Russia and elsewhere. And the conservative position in relation to money was totally just a, just a mirroring or opposing the liberal concept. It was based on the idea that it, Russia, first of all, Russia is different. Like every, there, there are no universal rules or laws of the political economy. It makes no sense. Like every country has its own um, like nature. And therefore, mm -hmm. you cannot use Adam Smith applied to, to the Russian case. It's just, it's not going to work. Because sure. Adam Smith, this is only applicable to, to Britain. And they said, no, Russia is different. And in Russia, the value of money is based not on labor, not on bullion reserve, but on the power of the autocrat, on the trust people, people's trust in 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 the in the love and the figure of the czar. So everything emanates from the czar. Um, and all of this, you know, the gold reserve, the silver reserve, or all other explanations that are totally inapplicable to the Russian case. So this idea uh, appeared in the early 19th century and it continued to these two trends, liberal conservative, continued to coexist um, in the 19th century. Therefore, every time when the liberals would say, we need to fix the currency system, we need to create an independent central bank, um, these ideas were immediately read uh, or perceived as a threat to autocracy. It's something sure. that really is going to shake this uh, autocratic model, introduce constitution, something alien to Russian political models and, and model and ideas. So can you explain the relationship between the state banks, the treasury, and the monarchy in the 1820s and 1830s? Who answered to who? And I guess my second question would be, was there any accountability between any of them? Everything was just in, belonged to, to the Tsar's government. So yeah. there is no balance of power, no separation of power of, of any sort. Treasury was a part of uh, Kazanjistu in Russia, was a, belonged to the government. So it, it was governed by um, bureaucrats uh, appointed by the Tsar as well as the Ministry of Finance. Mm -hmm. there, were, there were the Asenia banks that I mentioned before, and they are totally controlled also by the Ministry of Finance that was created in the early um, 19th century. That was the only innovation of creating the government as, a, as opposed to just the, 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 the uh, rule of advisors. So sure. Things were bureaucratized. This is the main change that occurred in the early 19th century, institutionalized. But uh, everything was put in one pocket on the one box and this is the executive power so whereas in england for instance uh, there was the bank of england it stood independently it had private funds funds in russia the the banks uh, these asinia banks they totally belong to the government were totally controlled by the government so they're actually the unit of the government not separate from from it in in any possible way and this uh, power of spending and power of issuing money it was like the, the two hands of, of the same person. So what caused the, the Asignat to go away ultimately? And w w what political reform brought that about? Well, uh, we should mention that um, before, be, because of the wars, and there was, uh, uh, we mentioned previously the Russo-Turkish wars, like several mm -hmm. of them in the 18th century, then the uh, late 18th century, early 19th century, uh, Anton the Polonian campaign, and of course, what we call the patriotic war against Napoleon. So the uh, the consequence of all this uh, continuous warfare was, of course, that the Russian finance uh, were totally ruined, and uh, the value of Asinia fell by seventy five percent. So the one ruble Asinia uh, cost twenty five silver kopecks, right? Mm -hmm. So just a quarter of, of uh, its original uh, value. And the government tried different um, means to somehow a little bit raise the value of the asset. It didn't work. Um, and uh, so the reform that uh, was um, originated in the 1830s and late 1830s and, and complete in 1843, finished in 1843, um, it aimed at exempting the asinator was totally hopeless. There was mm -hmm. no way of uh, doing anything with them. 
And uh, the situation on the eve of this reform was very bizarre and annoying for the government because what happened is that the market started regulating these fluctuating rates between sure. different kinds of, uh, of, of coins and in, in money circulation. The government didn't like it. And it just uh, withdrew the asset as an exchange and um, introduced a new kind of money, Russian state credit, uh, state credit rubles. Sure. So Nikolai I invented the Treasury Bullion Reserve that was held in the Peter and Paul Fortress. If trust was important, like you mentioned, that's a theme that your book hits on so many times, no matter what structure we talk about. Was the idea behind the Bullion Reserve to just show physical gold or make people believe that there was physical gold in hope that that would cause trust? Yes, you described it uh, very well. Exactly. That was the idea behind this reform. So uh, Nicholas was a very staunch nationalist. He also thought that he was a good economist. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, he was probably aware of different ideas, including the ideas of the gold standard. Uh, he probably read something about the Bank of England and and how uh, financial um, how currency functioned in, in other countries, and he designed um, a model that looked like European model, looked like a little bit like a, a even British model, but it was totally different from the political point of view. So he set up this uh, the government set up this bullion reserve, put it in the Peter Fall. Peter and Paul fortress next to the 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 cathedral, uh, which is uh, also a, a burial place for all czars uh, for the Romanov dynasty, and the idea was yes to demonstrate so uh, the the new state card rubles were all backed up by this reserve, mm-hmm. but at the same time what happened this is a very important thing that I mentioned that there were these Asinia banks which belonged to the government, but still these were separate institutions. So Nikos decided, so we don't need the banks. If the money makes, if the government makes money, uh, why do we need the banks? It's just these banks were totally just abolished. And it was this treasury that started, um, the government The government started issuing um, the, the, the new banknotes uh, on its own behalf. So you mentioned credit rubles had been created. How were credit rubles different than assignats or rubles themselves? So the the credit rubles were essentially the same assignats um, of uh, of of um, seventeen sixty nine. Mm-hmm. Um, in principle, the principle was that there was a reserve, there was a bullion reserve, and uh, and silver, um, a little bit of gold, uh, also like um, state obligations, and the ruble initially. Uh, this uh, state rubles were initially exchangeable, so people could actually come as as well as the seniors in the first years. They come could come in exchange, um, and uh, there there are now other uh, mechanisms. For instance, that uh, that involves the uh, as I mentioned in the book, the term credit was an emergency number. <laughs> Mm-hmm. There is no connection to the credit operation because the government is is not a bank, right? If the government issues money, it's not engaging in credit um, uh, transactions. So it was just a kind of paper money that trusted on this bullion reserve and the government authority. So let's see, to come back to another idea, um, we, we also see the other central theme. You touched on it just real quickly, but I do want to use an example in your book. You talked about the other systems that were on the edges of the Russian Empire. So we talked about Alaska, but let's use the other the other Western Front. Let's talk about Poland. What was going on in eighteen in the eighteen forties and eighteen fifties in Poland? Why was Russia so interested in their effect on the Polish monetary system at that time? Yes, uh, just a little bit of background. Poland became uh, uh, a part of the Russian Empire in the eighteenth century. So Catherine the Great. Uh, uh, along with uh, Prussia and Russia, along with Prussia, Prussia and the Habsburg Empire, partitioned Poland. Sure. Uh, and then the partition, this the partition, the elimination of the Polish state was complete in 1815, when the Kingdom of Poland was formed within the Russian Empire with some political and financial autonomy. And Alexander the First, he was very benevolent. 
uh, and he granted not only constitution to the kingdom of Poland, but also the right to have uh, its own currency, Polish slot. And this uh, f- Polish financial organization from the very beginning was different from, from the Russian pol- pol- financial organization. Zloty were not connected to the rubles, and, and Poland economically was more oriented toward the West. Um, uh, also, in 1926, uh, Poland, uh, the Polish government established uh, a ba- Bank Polski, the Bank of Poland, that mm-hmm. functioned uh, as a as a very not so totally independent, but resemble in central banks um, uh, as, as we think about them, the independent central banks. So, uh, and uh, the the the, Pol- bank, uh, the Bank of Poland was issuing paper banknotes that uh, were exchangeable, convertible, um, and circulated um, freely as, as also the, um, the work as a means uh, of credit. But what happened is in 1830 was a rebellion or the revolution in Poland. Um, and there was a revolution against Russian autocracy. And Nicholas I, he was a ruler at that time, he was furious. And the consequence um, of this rebellion was the gradual elimination of political uh, autonomy. So Poland, mm-hmm. Kingdom of Poland lost the constitution, but monetary system is also a projection of political rights. Um, so the next step will be gradual restriction on the autonomy of Poland to have uh, its own money. And it first started with just uh, introducing bilingual coins and changing the denomination of the coins so they would be uh, easily convertible into rubles. And when uh, in 1840, uh, 40s, when the, um, there was another revolution um, in, in Europe, Russia just flooded, Russia participated in the anti-revolution campaign in Europe, Russia just flooded um, Poland with uh, its paper asinia, uh, paper credit rubles, mm-hmm. and the result was that just the demise of uh, of Polish monetary system that became complete in the 1860s after the Second Polish Rebellion, when the, the slotage was just abolished, and a few years later the Bank of Poland was uh, also totally eliminated. So as at this time, uh, during, let's see, to get my notes correct here, during, I think it was Alexander the First reign, you have, you know, liberalism floating around, calling for a constitution. This is Russia, as we've been talking about. So again, we, we're still dealing with this autocracy, whether it wants to accept the idea of, of, of a, kind of a liberal constitution. To use uh, Peter Valuve as an example, he really argued, uh, to quote your book, he suggested that only a constitution could strengthen financial credibility, and the czar's sovereign power did not extend into the sphere of finance. So liberalism was calling for finance to be really a standalone part of the economy outside the sphere of the monarchy. And the question would be, you know, even though Alexander I was, you know, a more enlightened king or monarch, why wouldn't he allow this? Uh, well, <laughs> interestingly, that um, the czars can have uh, the Russian czars. Some of them were have uh, had their liberal education. They entertained mm-hmm. liberal ideas, but none of them ever wanted to restrict their own authority. Sure. So we can read uh, Rousseau, maybe even like uh, Adam Smith, but when it comes to uh, one's personal power. Nobody wants to. No, I want to get get rid uh, um, of of my power to um, to control financial uh, state finance or to control legislative process. None of them ever done <laughs> done this. And uh, this is, by the way, also a good example to explain this Valuev quote that you mentioned that. Um, when Valuev uh, said or wrote to Alexander II that only financial constitution, or only political constitution can save uh, or improve financial standing um, of, uh, of the ruble. What was the meaning of this quote? Valuev was not a liberal. He was a technocrat. And this is a new time, 1860, 1860s, and the new generation of Russian bureaucrats who were also very well versed in liberal ideas, but were not liberals in in the soul. But practically, they knew that uh, Europe is almost totally constitutional, or the political principles of of European creditors are totally different. And Russia is seen as a very 
barbaric corner of, of Europe where uh, there is autocracy when the Tsar uh, can do whatever he, um, he wants. And what Valuyev was suggesting, that if we want to get um, loans in Europe, if we want uh, our currency to have good uh, exchange rate, mm -hmm. we should do something with a political responsibility. Why? Because the, uh, other countries and the creditors are not uh, valuing uh, Russian national ca currency because of this lack of anyone's responsibility and this unlimited nature of the Tsar's authority. I want to give a big shout out to everyone who's listening to the show. You know, we recently hit the top 10 in investing podcasts on Apple Podcasts and even number one in the business category in several countries. As you may know, this show is brought to you by Smee Capital Management. Smee understands how frustrating and illogical the stock market can be. If you are searching for funds with a proven track record, give the Smeet Funds a look. Or better yet, reach out at SmeetCap.com. And don't forget to mention you're a fan of the podcast. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Investing involves risk, including loss of principal. Please refer to the prospectus for important information about the investment company, including objectives, risks, charges, and expenses. Read and consider it carefully before investing. Smeet Funds distributed by UMB Distribution Services, LLC, not affiliated. So Malstov was a very interesting character uh, in, in your 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 book. Um, he was an exceptional person as a businessman, um, but had a unique situation with the currency. Um, had it had kind of touches of the Alaska situation. But can you teach our audience who he was and and why he was such an interesting story inside of Russia? Yeah, Malstov. Um, yes, yeah, so he was a businessman who I uh, created a network of uh, like, uh, factories and essentially was almost a, a republic within, uh, or not not a republic, uh, a, a separate state w within uh, uh, Russia. And uh, Maltsov introduced uh, um, its own currency uh, in response to a very ubiquitous uh, problem uh, familiar not to Russia but uh, also to all uh, other states, the uh, what we call the the problem of the big problem of small change, the, the just uh, um, the deficit of um, of coins uh, and small change, and uh, also introduced in several provinces in um, uh, that uh, where his factories were located. It's just a separate private kind of. Uh, uh, money. And uh, interestingly, uh, I mentioned as a republic, which is perhaps a, um, a, a not a good term to describe it, because Maltsev's uh, state was just mirroring the Russian state. He was like a monarch in the territory uh, of, of the factories that uh, in, in this uh, uh, villages that, around the factories that he sure. uh, administered. Therefore, this this money was just a projection of of the Russian autocratic financial system. So uh, another example that reminds me of the bullion um, in the the Peter and Paul fortress, um, but I wanted to ask it when they started to uh, burn assignats and credit rubles. Was that just to kind of show the people, see, we're not printing money, we're actually getting rid of it, just to kind of promulgate this idea of trust that obviously might not be true, but it's just the effect it's trying to have on the, the psychology? Exactly. Um, you, you rightly pointed out this connection between the splendor of the gold reserve and all these rituals and ceremonies of, for instance, moving the gold reserve from the banks to this beautiful fortress it was not just you know they, they put it on the on the on the, on transport and, and quietly move it. No, it was, everything was done with a lot of this you know celebration and and, and symbolism just to show um, the um, the the existence of this reserve and the the power of the state and. The situation with the burning of this um, uh, uh, assignats and the credit rubles that were withdrew, withdrawn from circulation is very similar. To show um, people, 
but uh, most importantly, foreigners who were in the capital, that mm-hmm. the government uh, really cares about the uh, in, in control uh, the circulation of paper uh, paper notes. Therefore, the burning of the ruble was always a public ceremony. People were invited as if it was like a, a theatrical performance. There were the tickets sold and, and v- invitations uh, um, distributed to come and watch how the, the old money is burning. So stock exchanges were another um, interesting dialogue at parts of your book, especially in the latter part. They were obviously influential But they were influential, what I deemed to be from a money market perspective. Is that what was primarily traded there were just, you know, uh, was money markets or were there actually, there were actual businesses being traded on on markets? Uh, Businesses as well, of course. Um, After the 1860s, we can... Uh, R- Russia changed a lot in in the mid 19th century. What was new mm-hmm. was the liberation of economic regime that allowed for creation for the creation of joint stock companies, um, and a, a lot of new businesses appeared in a matter of a few decades. And of course, also new private banks. That was a very very new thing that hadn't existed before. And um, Russia was, a, we should keep it in mind, it was a capitalist country. So it was, a, of course, the Russian capitalism was different from other kinds of capital, capitalism and developed in a slightly different manner. But still, it was, there was free market. And uh, therefore, the stock exchange, um, they, they were very important financial institutions there for, for the money market, but also for um, for companies. And they had a significant influence uh, over um, local financial policies, but also the government had to consult the, represent- the representative of stock exchange communities while making very important decisions. So the next person that becomes a very unique character in the view of monetary policy, and I say interesting because... He couldn't make up his mind, depending on what part of his life he was in, was Sergei Witt. What was his role? And, and can you teach us about his, his uh, movement back and forth of his monetary views? Uh, of course. So Sergei Vita, um, he was um, very, very interesting and a very strong and important figure in Russian political and economic uh, history. Um, unlike all other ministers of finance, he later became a minister of finance, he had a totally different background. He, he was a businessman, an engineer by education. He worked in private railroads, so uh, he knew how uh, private businesses operated, um, uh, not from textbooks, but from, from experience. Later, he worked in the Ministry of Communication, Public Transportation. Uh, but there was another feature of his uh, early career and development. He was exposed to uh, influence from nationalist and conservative press and, and, and circles. His uncle was a very prominent um, nationalist. Um, so when he came to office as a minister of finance in the early um, 1890s, he was a committed nationalist. He had ideas of... Um, uh, Russia's exceptionality, how Russia is different from the West. West. He uh, loved the ideas of Friedrich List, the, the German uh, economist, who tried to combine nationalism with uh, economic development. So the consequences were uh, the introduction of protect, uh, protection tariffs, and uh, so this help that the government had to help local businesses they, uh, and attention to uh, to agriculture. But when it came to money, Vita, um, at first, he, pain, he penned this project of very inflationist uh, project of developing Russian railroad system through the issuance of, of um, just additional uh, special kind of paper money, uh, railroad assignats, railroad money. And the, uh, this idea was totally bizarre. And of course, uh, there is very little economic rationality. But the most amazing thing, uh, from my point of view about Vita was he was very flexible and he could make a U-turn in a matter of few, maybe months or weeks, if not days or, or minutes. Sure. And it's, uh, when people um, convinced him that this is a, 
irrational. This is going to lead it nowhere. Uh, and this is just, just bad. He, after a while, he, he changed his opinion just to, just to the opposite. He made this U-turn and instead of creating new kinds of inflationist currency, he um, took the path toward uh, Russia's transition to the gold standard. So can you explain the bear squeeze that he pulled off you know, while he had this role? Yeah, well, uh, the, the first steps uh, in, in his policy of maintaining Russian uh, ruble or fin- forming Russian rules was to do something with the fluctuation um, of ruble's rate because uh, uh, Russia, the rate of the ruble was extremely volatile. It was back and forth, back and forth, and up and ups and downs, but mostly downs, of course. Uh, mm-hmm. The reason uh, was that uh, um, because of this fluctuation, ruble is very attractive uh, kind of assets for for all kinds of speculation on uh, uh, stock exchanges, especially in Germany. So uh, Vita decided that uh, the best way to um, do it is just to, to play the same rules as a as, um, as this uh, speculators, so the government acted as a speculators by uh, making uh, a pledge for this future uh, contracts and then using a third, uh, using private agents um, exempting uh, all Russian rubles from circulation that available purchasing all rubles in circulation in Europe at the time mm-hmm. when this uh, obligation matured. And uh, people who made this future promises were um, desperate to get uh, Russian credit rubles and couldn't find them anywhere. Mm-hmm. So Vita just told them that uh, uh, this is it. This is the the speculation has to end. And uh, the techniques was a later. I think that people say, like economists say, that he invented this techniques that of bear squares and in the first time practice in. In the situation with the uh, uh, state, uh, Russian state credit rubles. When he also created the imperial ruble, and why was, I, I guess maybe the question shouldn't be why was it needed, but how was the imperial ruble different than what had been prior? So uh, the main uh, reform that Vita managed to accomplish was putting the ruble on the gold standard. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the uh, and of course, he he just finished the reform, the the long process that some of his predecessors had done before him, because Russia had been accumulated gold, buying gold, for for several years by selling grain um, on on the Western market and uh, uh, just getting more and more gold into the coffins of of the state bank. So what Vita did is um, the the reform uh, kind of consisted of developing the ruble um, by a, a third and putting on the gold standard. Um, so that was uh, the main uh, innovation, and the reform was, of course, there are many steps in in this process, but it was complete by 1897. And uh, the new uh, gold based ruble was um, uh, the, the main rationale for introducing the gold based rule or for Russia switching to the gold standard was uh, to attract foreign investment. Sure. Uh, because uh, Russia was not considered a good place to invest money because exactly because of the, the ruble's uh, fluctuating qualities. So Westerners um, were very cautious because you can invest in using your I don't know, francs or or, or marks, and then the ruble falls, and you lose some of like significant part of your investment. So uh, for Vita, that uh, uh, that concern, the uh, lack of capital and the lack of foreign investment, was uh, the main goal that he wanted wanted to um, achieve by this uh, gold uh, standard reforms. Um, and uh, and it's, we can say that he achieved this goal because after the stabilization of ruble's rate. On the basis of of of, uh, of gold, uh, we can uh, um, Russia witness a surge of, of foreign investment. So, from this point of view, the reform was um, successful. Well, so, to your point, it increased foreign investment, but these you know imperial rubles uh, could be exchanged for silver and gold. But that doesn't that affects people in society differently. Who who was affected by that changeover? Well, uh, in Russia. 
people who paid always the cost of all reforms were, of course, peasants. Uh, the, the last protected uh, Russia in in uh, the, the 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 people who who were bearing the cost of taxation the most mm -hmm. uh, significant part, and of course uh, every financial reforms of that kind inevitably led to the rise of prices. So peasants. Um, was effect, peasantry was affected in two ways. First of all, like the, in the most mundane level, because of the rise uh, of the growth of, of, of prices for all for all goods. Um, second is that uh, I mentioned that to maintain the gold standard, to maintain this gold reserve, Russia had the the largest at, at, at that at some point the, the largest in Europe gold reserve. Russia had to export grain. In, in huge quantities, huge quantities. And uh, Vitra's predecessor, uh, Vishnigradsky, the Minister of Finance, Vishnigradsky, even formulated uh, this principle as we better starve by it but export. So this uh, the priority was to export grain, even if it's at the cost of peasant starvation. And it indeed happened uh, when there was a huge famine in the early 1890s. So the, the cost for, for the peasantry that Russia had to export a lot of, of, of grain and who is the who is the producer of grain, of course, uh, 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 agrarian uh, sector and, and peasantry. And there was another, like a third maybe um, um, aspect of the reform that Vita, the way he imagined the gold standard is like everyone is going to use gold coins. Uh, sure. Indeed, the gold coins were introduced, um, including peasants. But the gold coins were very, um, uh, let me put it that way. Well, they were very expensive. <laughs> they, 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 sure. uh, and I think you also mentioned how heavy, how heavy they were to carry and, and transport. Exactly. They were heavy. They were um, uh, very uncomfortable. And then you can imagine that, you, for instance, I, I saw the story of, of people complaining that uh, someone is buying uh, like products on, on peasants' market, just going from one village to another and transporting all of these bags of coins uh, instead of uh, paper or rubles, uh, as, as was before the reform, because Vita ordered to withdraw from circulation all rubles of small denomination. Why? Because sure. uh, uh, these papers, um, these banknotes bank competed uh, with uh, the gold and silver coins. So that people were very much affected by the, they hated this reform because, and it looked also kind of coming back to the Middle Ages when, you know, instead of uh, we think that the paper money is a more modern uh, ways of, of of monetary, a new, more, more modern financial instrument. But uh, in Russia, the, the movement was just in the opposite direction uh, towards the return to the coins and, and the metal-based um, economy. So people didn't like it. So another question I want to ask is, um, looking at you know World War One, how did war change the currency? Obviously, as you talked about, numerous countries they suspended the gold standard. You know you could not exchange their currency for gold or bullion. And how did that affect countries like Russia and their ability to stay on this you know imperial ruble or what we'll call the gold standard? Uh, Russia was uh, very much affected by that, by the war. It had to suspend um, the exchange, uh, uh, of course. But um, the war revealed one uh, major shortcoming of, of the Vita system. Call it the Vita system because, of course, the, the money question was just of what one element in, in the totality of the system. Mm -hmm. Vita paid too much attention to finance and very little attention to sustainability of economy. That was a, um, the, the, the biggest mistake of, of, of the government before World War I. Because when the World War I started, it turned out that Russia had to buy almost everything um, on the Western market. And of course, to, uh, to pay for these products, um, like chemical, um, everything that uh, uh, the, the chemical industry products, the for ammunition, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to pay for these products in gold. So the gold reserve that was supposed to back up um, paper rubles was just uh, 
spent on on the purchases um, of, of these uh, items, and uh, and of course Russia also had to contribute um, to the uh, allies' efforts, and um, uh, therefore of course uh, um, there was a huge uh, blow and the, uh, the huge uh, shock for for Russian finance. And I think you point out really well that not only was there a lack of leadership and thought on the finance side, like you just mentioned, but you also pointed out that there was also just a lack of leadership from obviously the czar at that moment, because it wasn't just costly in the payments and trying to get the money to fight a war. It was also costly in lives. Can you talk about the underinvestment in capital, but I'll really say armament compared to other countries and therefore how humans were the actual sacrifice in World War I for Russia? Yes, uh, uh, if we compare um, the performance of different countries during World War I um, in uh, Russia's financial contribution and Russia's contribution in terms of the, the lives um, uh, of people, soldiers and also civilians, we'll see that uh, financially Russia did not contribute as much as, as, other, as other allies. Mm -hmm. But the human cost was just enormous. Um, and uh, the human cost in terms of the, the lives of soldiers who perished on the battlefield, uh, but also um, in terms of the um, the, the hardship, um, like uh, uh, famine and um, people just deprived of, of uh, the basic... Um, um, food and basic items of consumption. So Russia was hit very, very hard. And taking into account that, in general, the level of wealth in Russia was very low comparing to like France or, or Britain. You can imagine mm -hmm. the to what degree of poverty um, uh, and what degree of poverty people uh, find themselves in after uh, two years of war. Sure. And also you get the sense that like to our discussion earlier, if you think about trust, there was not only a lack of trust in the currency or the monetary system, but then you add that you add a lack of trust for human life during World War I, and you could kind of understand how the vacuum of power got bigger and bigger. So obviously the, the czar abdicates, I think it was what, 1917, the provincial government comes in, which is a weak government at best, and then the Bolsheviks come you know, in to take that vacuum that was present, but even they really couldn't decide what they wanted in a monetary system. Can you just explain what was their debate? What, what were the primary two options they debated? Uh, uh, with the Bolsheviks, uh, I wouldn't even use this term debate because uh, when the revolution happened, before the revolution, nobody really thought about financial system because mm -hmm. Marx didn't give an advice of, of how... Um, money will function uh, under socialism there is no recipe ready for for um, for for the socialist economy so the only solution was formulated uh, in the beginning by Vladimir Lenin who on the eve of the revolution wrote a long long article on the state revolution and where he explains that um, although we think that under communism in the in the future there will be no state there will be no money, there will be no banks. In the first years after the revolution, the proletarian state will have to use the same institutions as as the uh, as existed in the capitalist uh, under sure, the capitalist kind of a, regime. Sure, kind of a transition system in a way. Yes, exactly, the transition system, but uh, everything was uh, owned and run by the proletarian state. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can imagine that all of this, I mentioned there are a lot of private banks. So all of these banks were nationalized, right? The, the, uh, then uh, 1918 is a wave of uh, nationalization of private businesses and factories. Uh, and if before the state was only managing uh, a limited state sector, uh, sector as well as, uh, of course, the monetary system, now the mm -hmm. state had to take care of everything, like all banks, all factories, everything in, in the state. So mm -hmm. now the state had to run this immense, the gigantic machine uh, that included the the old old credit system apparatus as well as the old nationalist enterprises, mm -hmm. and um, the Bolsheviks had to um, use also 
uh, ironically, the the old czarist money. So the the banknotes with all the, the symbols of the old regime continue to circulate, and and the Bolsheviks even continued printing them using the old mm. um, templates uh, because the um, they had no capacity of producing enough new banknotes, the Soviet banknotes, just to satisfy the demand um, of this. Inf- is economy in the situation was, uh, in the situation of uh, insane inflation and i think i think in your writing you explain so well that in if, if i i understand it perfectly in effect they were trying to keep like a general ledger system that would account for everything in society you know what we know truly as a quote unquote planned economy they wanted to ultimately get rid of the currency but i think it even pointed out that they still ranked people by their job which if you're ranking people by their job, you de facto have a currency system because you're valuing the individuals differently. And you know the system kept trying to keep old vestiges, if you will. Is that a fair way of thinking about it? Yes, that's a, that, that is actually perfect because you describe the inability of, of the Bolsheviks to design a, a totally different system of currency. Mm-hmm. There are some ideas, uh, for instance, the um, idea of labor money. Uh, the idea is that there will be no currency as such uh, based on gold or silver or anything material. But the, the, the money, uh, the new currency, the new currency, uh, banknotes were backed up by labor so everyone uh, by the the <laughs> by products and by labor um, uh, of of the proletariat um, of, of workers so the idea was exactly as you described that everyone will the the, the money will be denominated in hours <laughs> or sure. labor days and days not not hours because they have just nobody had watch or uh, watches or anything so the labor days will use as a unit um, of of currency, but essentially, if you think about it, this is the same idea as the gold standard or any other uh, idea of money that exists at that time. You just keep the gold element going back to labor. So the, there is still the same equation um, uh, between um, a currency and something that backs it up. When I, I the idea that you just mentioned, I don't want to gloss over this, but if you're going to go out and tell people it's your hours or like you said, it's your days you spend, and all these peasants have no watches, how how can you have a sense of time if no one has a concept of time? Um, and it just shows you how kind of uh, it, these were all uh, kind of circular arguments that could ultimately go nowhere uh, for even the individuals. So let me let me take let me take one other step because I. I mean, I, as I'm reading through this, the themes of Russia are still the themes of Russia. Um, the idea of absolute power or control or this idea of autocracy is still very present. Um, the idea of the movement of the value of the ruble and how that affects society. Um, ultimately, if the government doesn't care, the government doesn't care, even today, I would argue. And then we have this idea of war, war being a very important concept in the scheme of the empire if you will. And I think of all these, you know, what someone could say are 18th or 19th century ideas. And isn't this very analogous to the 21st century Russia that we see with what's going on with Putin? In other words, we saw a war, the value of the currency went way down initially in that war. And then to your point, we've seen assets be nationalized. Either if you're on the, you're on Putin's side, you're fine to operate, right? You're, you're there aligning with the state, let's call it. But if you're not, the assets have gone away. It, 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 isn't that really the autocracy of the 18th and 19th century more so? Absolutely. And uh, of course, uh, po- political scientists uh, called Putin's regime uh, an autocratic regime for, for a good mm-hmm. reason. And it's on, not only in the sphere of finance, but also, of course, in, 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 the, in the way, the nature of, of his power. Uh, but uh, you're right that the, that there is such a strange and even eerie, <laughs> I would say weird, um, mm-hmm. resemblance between 
Putin's ideas and ideas of 19th century monarchists and conservatives. Sometimes I, I, I think that when I listen to him talking about economic matters, that he probably read some of this, uh, maybe Sharapov or somebody else, some of those you know think, conservative thinkers who were saying that Russia is different. Russia is not like the Western countries. We don't care about the standards. We don't care about the right rate of exchange because Russia... Uh, is can survive by its own. It's self-sustainable, and um, it it is even improper to think about uh, the financial costs of war because this is a war for uh, Russia's dignity, Russia's honor, or for like a higher truth of you know. Well, you can now <laughs> think about everything that Putin says about uh, their. Sorry, I have to quote his like false brotherhood of Ukrainian Russian um, peoples. Sure. So uh, all this rhetoric is is so similar to the rhetoric of nineteenth um, century uh, nationalists. It sometimes is very surprising. As I read through your book and think about two differences compared to then, is that back then. Russia was still a growing population. In other words, Russians had a lot of kids, even though there was strife and there was problems in society. You know, it was a growing population ultimately. Today, Russia is a shrinking population, which is a difference compared to then. And I know your book didn't touch on that, but that's, I just know that data to be true. But I think the difference, the other difference that your, your book, someone could draw that's very different than Putin's world, is if Russia was seeking to enforce itself on another land, you would have a direct war. Right. In other words, they're going to go fight the Ottoman Empire. They're directly fighting the Ottoman Empire, and the world that the world that Putin is having direct conflict with is actually a Western world that likes fighting proxy wars, right? Which is not which is not something that the the, the monarchs of Europe would do. They fought direct wars and campaigns. How do you see? And I just, I'll, I'll give you my answer, but I'd love to hear your take because obviously you, you're Russian. You've lived in Russia. I look at Ukraine as the war is actually over because Putin is willing to do whatever it takes, much like other other autocrats in your book would do whatever it takes to have their will be seen, whether or not the you know the autocracy would survive. Do, do you look at Putin the same way um, versus these Western powers that will fight proxy wars but will never come in direct contact with Putin? Yeah, uh, Putin is a person of the 19th century, I sometimes think, because he, uh, and despite the difference that you, you just outlined concerns the population, and uh, he probably doesn't even understand that the, the world is not the same, right? Um, mm -hmm. uh, that there is, there, there is this international community and, and uh, it's impossible to fight the wars in isolation. But at the same time, uh, he has this a very bizarre mix, mixture of rationality that supports irrational ideas. So mm -hmm. the idea of uh, of um, getting Ukraine back into the Soviet Union, into this uh, Slavic fold, is it, totally irrational. It's very bizarre. It's it's it, uh, and um, there is no rationality in fighting the war, which dis may destroy can destroy uh, your own power and, and empire at the end. Uh, but at the same time, everything that he, he builds around uh, so far has been rational. So, he, you know, there, we are not going to go into details about the sanctions regimes, but uh, we see that the Western powers are losing. And uh, maybe it's just their fault, their miscalculation of how to... Uh, check Russia's uh, financial resources or limit Russian financial resources. Or maybe it's a good calculation on, on the Russian side that the sanctions are not going to affect um, so significantly Russian economy. It, and uh, it, it, as, as you mentioned in the beginning of the war, ruble collapsed, but then it grew back. Um, and the uh, Russian budget is suffering. Of course, it's, it's undeniable because Russia spends a huge amount of, of money on that. But at the same time, Russia sells uh, sells oils, and there are so many loopholes on on how to avoid sanctions. So so far, this uh, the nineteenth century mind with twenty uh, first century techniques of avoiding uh, international pressures um, s somehow survived this, you know, oxymoronic combination. 
while the Western powers, uh, I think that they, they do not yet understand this uh, uh, peculiar combination and this mixtures of ideas, and they are so stuck in in this no, I know textbook principles of how to deal with an aggressor. Now that you said that, I think the only other thing I can think of as a difference is um, obviously after after the Romanovs and Nicholas II abdicated, uh, if you were a duke or you were a princess, you could just go off to Paris. Uh, I don't think Putin and his allies might have the same uh, ability. <laughs> I don't think they'll be accepted in Paris uh, like they were back then. Um, uh, Ekaterina, this has just been such a wonderful thing. I, I'm going through my notes here. There's quite a few things we didn't talk about from your book that I had uh, questions on. I'll just mention a few for our readers because I think it's such a it's such a wonderful story and thinking about uh, you know over 200 years of Russian history through the lens of you know the currency system. But, uh, you know, we didn't talk a whole lot about the idea of a central bank in Russia, for example. I'm looking elsewhere here in my notes. We didn't talk about the Bukharian economy and how that was also different. We didn't talk about Finland as another example of that. Um, but I, I want to ask you, you know, where can our listeners follow you going forward? If they're sitting here saying, well, if she's saying Putin's like the autocratic world of the 19th century, I find that terribly true. And I find that terribly interesting. You know, is where can they find you out on social media or what's the best way for them to follow your writing going forward? Uh, I am on social media and uh, X or whatever it's called now, yeah. Twitter, <laughs> uh, uh, Facebook, although I write, uh, of course, a lot in, in Russian <laughs> about sure. politics, about history. And uh, uh, also I invite to visit the web page of Princeton program in Russian history and in Eurasian studies. We have a lot of interesting things there. I was just going to ask you, what, what's your handle on, on X? Uh, I, I'm, I used to, I know I actually subscribed only when the war began because I, okay. we all had this, you know, deficit of information. Sure. Uh, and uh, I've wrote and I read a lot. But uh, recently, and it's, it's, it, Russia is constantly there, the waves of crisis, right? And I usually start using it again when uh, something happens, like Navalny's death. Gotcha. Uh, and we all got back because of, of it's a, uh, also collective uh, therapy, so to say, when you connect and see pictures uh, coming from uh, Russia. But I, I'm not a super active <laughs> user, okay. gotcha. I must confess. Ekaterina, this has been very educational. For our readers, the ruble is a wonder pic wonderful picture of the legacy of Russia and the interplay between politics, money, and ultimately, as we just discussed, power. For those of you that think autocracy today is new, uh, through Ms. Pravilova's work, you'll learn that this may be normal. If you enjoyed the podcast, go to Apple, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you listen to A Book With Legs. Give us a review. Tell others about the books and, and great authors like E. Katrina Pavlova that we have the opportunity to understand and study the world with and through. For our tribe, if you have a great book that you'd like to recommend, email podcast at smeadcap.com. That's podcast at smeadcap.com. You can also send your suggestion to us on X. Our handle is at smeadcap. Thank you for joining us for A Book With Legs podcast. We look forward to the next episode. Thank you for listening to A Book With Legs, a podcast brought to you by Smead Capital Management. The material provided in this podcast is for informational use only and should not be construed as investment advice. You can learn more about Smead Capital Management and its products at smeadcap.com or by calling your financial advisor.